Now we are in a good position to go ahead and um, finally reveal the type of definition deficiency that we had in our normal stress strain relationship for even for the case of isotropic linear elasticity, which was what was employed in ME231 throughout. Um, and the topic is called the generalized um, Hooke's law. And it is something that you generally have to employ in um, 3D. So let us, if you like, squeeze in here as a reminder of uh, the notation 3D so that we remember um, in general for three-dimensional loading we will need generalized Hooke's law. Okay, so just remember we are in the context of linear elasticity and in the context of linear elasticity I'm going to do an experiment and that experiment is going to make use of a cube that we often will use, a simple cube. It's not a small material element in the vicinity of some structural point. It is a cube, okay? Um, and I'm going to do an experiment as follows. Um, so first let's indicate some coordinates x, y and z and the experiment I will do uh, is going to be as follows. I am going to um, impose a certain amount of force or stress in a certain direction and that will be implied here. Okay, So that's going to be the stress I will impose. So for instance, I am going to impose a stress along the x direction. And as a result of that stress, I am going to uh, monitor the resulting strain in each direction. And those directions are x, y, and z. Okay. All right. In each direction. Um, so let us first do the experiment with sigma x. I impose a stress on the x related faces of this cube. So I, in other words, there's a sigma x there and of course goes without saying I pull in the other direction and I'm interested in the amount of strain that I measure along each direction. Okay, so well, um, seems like an easy question. Fair enough. And so you can go ahead and actually try to think about the answer for a few seconds, okay? Just to make sure that eventually we are on the same page, okay? So if you have thought about it for a, um, for a few seconds, well, the answer is, well, of course, there is going to be a epsilon x strain along the x direction, which is simply sigma x over e. Um, but there's also going to be a strain along the other two directions, right? Because remember the definition of the Poisson ratio, which is minus the strain in the transverse direction over the strain in the longitudinal direction. So in this case, the longitudinal strain is sigma x, and I get a strain epsilon x. So if this is epsilon x, the transverse strain, in this case, either epsilon y or z, the remaining two directions of the cube, is going to be this value times a minus times a nu. So it's going to be minus nu epsilon x, sigma x over e. Likewise for z. Okay. So what we are doing here is at the structural level we are pulling along the x direction and I see that along the y direction it gets thinner as well and if I turn to the thickness the thickness also gets reduced right so and that in terms of strain indicates the changes in the in plane the transverse directions in other words so let's do the same experiment along the y direction as well so sigma y is only impulse. So now forget about sigma x. It's not there. I only pull along that direction. 
And then what are the resulting strains? Well, there's going to be a strain along the y direction, simply sigma y over e. Um, and then that's the longitudinal strain now, and longitudinal direction is associated with, in this case, the y direction. So the other two directions are going to act as transverse directions. So there's going to be a minus nu times that strain for x and minus nu times sigma y over e for z. And finally, if I do the experiment for the z direction, we will have a, and we're forgetting about the other two, we're only pulling along the z direction, so we're going to have a strain sigma z over e over here, and then minus nu over e, sorry, minus nu times the resulting strain sigma z over e for y, and minus nu sigma z over e for the x direction as transverse strains, all right? So, uh, therefore, we have carefully answered the question, well, if there is a certain stress in one direction, what are the resulting strains? So, immediately, we can go back to the last example we considered. In that case, we did have only a normal stress sigma x, but I only monitored or calculated the value of the strain associated with the extraction. But now I realize, actually without any additional effort from my already existing knowledge, that there was and should have been a epsilon y as well as an epsilon z, right? Those we had not written explicitly, but they are there, okay? Um, so now, if I have only sigma x, that's the solution, and only sigma y, that's the solution, and only sigma c, that this is the solution to the problem. Now I am going to define a combined problem, and that combined problem is going to be indicated with that plus sign. And the combined problem indicates a scenario where on that cube I will have simultaneously a sigma x and a sigma y and a sigma z, not independently, all three at the same time are applied, and I am interested in the resulting strain along the x, y, and z directions. So, why don't you think about their values? So, the question is, what should be the resulting strain along each direction for the combined problem? And I already know the answer to the problem for each case. So, in other words, I know the answers to the individual loadings. I'm asking for the answer to the combined case. Okay. Um, so, well, again, if you've thought about that question, the question will have an answer, which is going to deliver a certain value of the strain epsilon x, and a certain value for the normal strain epsilon y, and another certain value for epsilon z. And conceptually, what I am doing, and all I am doing is, I am trying to deduce the result based upon individual problems to a new problem, which is defined as, in terms of loading, the sum of those problems. And therefore, we can, and you will rightly estimate that, um, the answer is also the sum of the individual answers. So, in other words, epsilon x is going to be 1 over this one, these, some of these three quantities, or 1 over e, sigma x minus nu sigma y plus c, and epsilon y is going to be 1 over e sigma y minus nu times, again, 1 over e, that common factor is there, and x plus c, sigma x plus c. And finally, epsilon z similarly is going to be 1 over e, common factor for all, sigma z only in the first one, and then minus nu multiplying the remaining two, sigma x plus sigma y. And why is that so? What is the principle that justifies me summing up the solutions of individual problems for a new problem which corresponds to the summing of the loadings for the individual problems, well, that is the superposition principle. 
can I apply the superposition principle to this setting? I can. And the justification for that is that I have a loading that is governed by linear elasticity. There are two requirements. It has to be elastic and among others, it has to be also a small deformation for superposition to apply. So that is exactly my case. So because we have linear elasticity, we can do this. Okay, it's important to always remember the assumptions. All right, so this is what I have for the normal stresses. Well, what about the shear stresses? Now, it turns out for the shear stresses, there is no complication. So for the shear stresses, if you want to calculate gamma xy, it is going to be equal to simply 1 over g tau xy and gamma yz is simply 1 over g tau xz and gamma zx is going to be simply 1 over g tau zx. Okay. So as I've said earlier, the relation tau equals g gamma or gamma equals 1 over g tau is, it turns out, always true um, in the context of isotropic linear elasticity. Okay. Uh, but the relation between normal stress and strain is not sigma equals E epsilon, okay? So if there are multiple stresses present, they will each have an effect on the strain along each direction. So this generalization, which is based on the knowledge of superposition and simply the definition of Poisson ratio, both of which we already know from ME231, uh, is called the generalized Hooke's law. And you have to remember emphatically that this is still a relation where isotropy is assumed. Okay? So what happens if isotropy does not hold? In other words, we have an isotropy. Well, that's a generalization that we will have to discuss separately. But now at this point, uh, you may want to go back and eventually uh, think about why you never needed these relations in ME231. Well, you never needed them but because, first of all, if you were dealing with shear problems, there was no problem with your relation to begin with. And if you were looking at problems like tension or bending where you had normal stresses, you were always had loading such that you had stresses associated only with one direction. So, for instance, in the case of bending, you built your geometry if the axis of loading is x on the understanding that there was only sigma x and the strain distribution, which is linear across the cross section, because after bending, straight sections remain straight, that was your assumption, you were able to relate epsilon to simply sigma over E because the other two components were really not there. So what you did in ME231 was certainly not wrong, but it was a scenario with limited generality on the types of loadings you had. So in this course, we will always be conserved to a great extent on complicated loadings where multiple stress components, normal stress components are present at the same time. So we will certainly need this generalization. Okay. So next, I'd like to go ahead and solve a problem uh, that demonstrates the importance of the generalized Hooke's law.